Good morning, church family. Welcome to Church Online. Uh, we've got a packed service for you today. We've got a time of worship. We've got uh, Steve talking to us about love and God's love. Looking at a passage uh, from the Old Testament and continuing our series looking through the television show, The Chosen. But before we get to the word and to worship, I have some family news for us. So, dates for the diary. The first date we'd love you to pop in the diary, well it's already in there, but highlight in the diary, is the 1st of March. It's Pancake Day, Shrove Tuesday. And on that Tuesday, I get to see how your church, how this church, how our church does Pancake Day. Now I've heard this is a bit of a tradition and I've heard that you go quite big. Last year, I joined in with you on Zoom as we sort of flipped a pancake in kitchens across Milton Keynes and us back in Norfolk. But I have heard that this is a big thing for the church. It's an opportunity to invite friends, family, neighbours along too. So the 1st of March, block it out, pop it in the diary, more news soon. The second date that we want to make you aware of, uh, which seems slightly self-serving, is my induction service as the Associate Minister. So the 6th of March, same week on the Sunday, um, it's a chance, uh, it says here to celebrate my arrival. Um, I, to be honest, think we need to pray for the church. Um, honestly, I think we need to pray for the church because it's a whole church effort, isn't it? Um, and yeah, I feel called to be here. And I'd love the church to pray for me. I'd love to pray for the church in what I think is a really exciting time right now. There's lots going on. It's, uh, it's a little bit scary and a little bit exciting. But um, that's the service we've set aside um, for prayer and for thanks. Um, that, you know, church and me, we've, we've come together for this, for this time. It's great. So that's on the 6th of March. Um, I've got some friends and family coming down uh, to see that as well. Um, so you get to like, meet my sister, my dad, that will be quite exciting for them or for you, I don't know. A couple of days later, Tuesday the 8th of March, mark it out. We are having a special church family meeting. Not a church members meeting, but a church family meeting. Now at the last members meeting, uh, we announced that we'll be holding this evening uh, on the 8th of, Mar 8th of March, which will be an evening of worship, of reflection, and of prayer. We're going to come together, we're going to try and seek God's heart for the building project. Um, we are committed to that first phase uh, of building, and this is an opportunity for us to seek God's will, and to find out whether we're able to as a church, and whether God wants us to as a church, go ahead with the phase one and phase two at the same time. And that's mainly a financial ask. There will be an opportunity for a free will offering on the night, um, but we're asking that you pray in the run up to that, um, that God's will really be made clear and made known. We are encouraging the whole church family to come along to that evening. I. I don't know if I've ever seen a meeting like it. I think it's going to be a fantastic opportunity just to sit there and say, God, what are you doing here? What are we doing? How do we go about this? Pop it in the diary um, and, and pray in the run-up to it if you, if you could. That would be fantastic. That's Tuesday the 8th of March. So there's three dates, early March, um, that are coming up. Uh, obviously, there's always the website. Um, church Suite, there are plenty of opportunities for you to find out uh, other things that are going on as well. Before we move to a time of worship, I'd like to just pray um, over the, sort of the church diary. It's a really interesting time right now. You know, we're moving out of a time where, where COVID restrictions um, are, are quite tight. Um, I know that, you know, there's still members of our church family that are experiencing COVID. It's still here. But hopefully we're moving to a time where we're able to meet safely, hopefully, together in ways that we've not been able to do so for the last couple of years. So we want to pray God's wisdom into that, that we get that right. So events like Pancake Day and other similar opportunities don't get missed. 
but we do them safely. Will you pray with me as we, as we raise these sort of opportunities uh, to the Lord? Lord God, we pray that you will lead us as to what we do as church. We pray that events and opportunities are grasped where it's right that we grasp them. We pray for the church meeting on the 8th. We pray that you will lead us and you will guide us and you will make your will clear. In these times, Lord God, when things are uncertain and different and new, we ask that you speak clearly to us, your people. And for today, Lord God, we ask that you bless our time of worship and of opening the Bible to us. We pray that you will bless us in this time and that you will teach us something new about you today. We ask this in your almighty, powerful, holy name. Amen. So let's move now into a time of worship. church family it's good to be with you today as we carry on this series of the chosen or thinking about what it means to be chosen as we think about it on Sundays and then you think about it in the life groups that you're in or through watching the series the chosen and today we're thinking about what it means to be cherished quite apt really on uh, Valentine's weekend so if you're watching this on Sunday today, or tomorrow rather, is Valentine's Day. So a chance that we get to show others that we cherish them, that we love them. Now I don't know what you think about those words, oh, I love you. 
I quite like those words. We use them a lot in our home. I use them, you'll be pleased to know, to my wife, Natasha. Um, and they're words that we use quite regularly to one another. Um, they're words that we use with our children. Uh, I can't, I don't know if they always like it or not. Um, and it's something that's normally in the house rather than saying it outside of the house. Um, but they're words that we use because we want to express that. But it's interesting, isn't it? If you were to speak to my father about it, my dad would say, well, they're, they're words that are too easily spoken and not always meant. Do we truly understand what it is that we're saying when we say to someone else, I love you? I don't think it's just dissimilar when we think about those words, did you know that God loves you? I think particularly in church circles, we hear it an awful lot. People say, oh, God loves you. And in the end, I'm not sure that when we hear the words, we always truly understand their enormity. And I'm not always sure, even in, when we hear them, that we truly know that we're loved. Truly know that we're loved by God. So many things can get in the way, right? So it might be that kind of having heard those words many times before, there can be fear related to it. We can have doubts. There can be experiences that we've had that make it difficult or how we perceive God or quite often how we perceive ourselves. Lots of things might spring to mind then when we read the words of Isaiah 43 and particularly verses 3 to 4 which we're going to read together now. For I am the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honoured and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. So much we could focus on in those words. We could focus upon the idea of ransom. The idea of exchanges being made in return for our lives. But what if those were only really there just to add weight to the words that we read at the start of verse 4? Because you are precious in my eyes and honoured and I love you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honoured and I love you. Take a moment. Just pause on those words. That's God speaking through Isaiah to the Israelite people and to you. Think about the enormity of that. The fact that you are cherished, you are loved by the creator of the world. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? Mind-blowing. So much so that it's easy to let our rational, adult, often, minds get in the way of really experiencing that love, allowing ourselves to experience that love. But I want to take a chance today a chance that brings with it, I'm very aware, lots of possible pitfalls, lots of rabbit warrens that we could go down. But I want to take that chance because I believe God wants each of you to know today more than anything else that you're cherished, that you're loved, and that that comes from the one who is love. And as we've said, there are all sorts of things that could get in the way of not just knowing that, but truly experiencing it, letting it permeate our lives. So I'm going to pray a prayer. The words are going to come on the screen and I'm going to invite you to pray these words out loud with me. Jesus, 
I want to experience your love. I know in my mind that you created me and made me good and perfect. I believe you came to give me life and set me free from the things that hold me captive. I believe you also came to show me what God is like. Please reveal to me today what God is like and how much I am loved. Amen. Okay. So what we're going to do, we're going to remove some of those thinking obstacles. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, working through my words today, working through God's word today, we're going to try and remove some of those thinking obstacles. And then we're going to worship at the end of this. So that we all get to enjoy being in the presence of the God who loved us. So let's think, what we're going to do is think about some questions that we might have, some obstacles that there might be to us knowing and experiencing God's love. And the first one of those is these. I've just got too many questions about how all of this works to accept that he loves me. We've all got questions, right? Even people who've been going to church all their lives have questions. Even people who follow Jesus for as long as they can remember. Even people who've seen miracles. Even pastors have questions. And questions can be good things. Jesus loved them. Asked them all of the time. Often in response to being asked a question himself. But we have to be careful. Because when the question becomes the focus, when wanting an answer to every nth degree of detail before agreeing to go anywhere or do anything happens, those questions become a stumbling block. They get in the way of the gift that God has for us. Just think about humanity's quest for answers about life, the universe and everything. And you can see how questions might be a problem. In so many ways, it's like the phase that children go through when all they seem to be able to say is why? Yeah, 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 but why? And we as parents often end up saying, because that's just how it is. I want you to know today that faith isn't the absence of those questions. But faith is believing that you don't need all of the answers to the questions because the, you trust the one who you're following. That they'll equip you with what you need for today. That's why knowing God's love is a faith thing. It's also why Jesus is recording in Mark 10 as saying, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom, and I might add in, and love of God like a child, shall not enter it. Church family, perhaps we have to stop asking so many questions to understand the divine. Now I know when I say that, that everything human suggests that if we stop asking questions, we become stupid. But what if, what if in doing that, we take a step towards God? Tell me, what would you rather? Hold on to your humanity? Or take a step towards the divine. Let's think of another obstacle. This whole love thing is not really how I've imagined God is. I wonder, what's your picture of God? Let's test it out, okay? So our world is this big. 
And the God-created universe is this big, if not even bigger. And so God, by definition, must also be even bigger. I don't know about you, but that's already messing with the picture of God that I started with. You see, the trouble is, we can only imagine God through a human lens. So God becomes a bigger version of a human-shaped being, but in that way, immediately is limited. Even if I try and think bigger, try and get my head around it, my divine-shaped God is still a divine-shaped God brought into being by human thinking, and so immediately is limited. If we look at the images we know of God from childhood, or the books we've read, unfortunately what we're often met with is God as an old, bearded, white, angry-ish old man who is hard to please and even harder to understand. He gave a long list of rules to follow, and we must follow them or we'd be punished. And he judges the world from a distance, smiting when necessary, because humans at their core are a pretty rotten bunch, unworthy of loving other than as a result of God's charity towards us. I want to say, church family, this morning, that's not the God that I think the Bible speaks of, that I know the Bible speaks of. How do I know that? Because of Jesus. The person that Isaiah was ultimately pointing towards in these words that he spoke to the Israelite people. And the man that Mary Magdalene and Nicodemus and Matthew and Simon Peter are getting to know in the Chosen series that we're watching. And I love today's theme because we get to see the truth of God's word across the Old Testament and into the New Testament, which this whole Chosen series is intended to do. You see, when God became human, Jesus not only revealed who God is, but revealed who we are too. So we're going to talk about who Jesus revealed God to be, but we've also got to recognise how it helps us understand who we are, because Jesus revealed that our humanity is still intrinsically good. How else could good become human if human didn't have the potential to be good? Let me say that again. How else could good become human if human didn't have the potential to be good? Are we wounded and broken and scarred and capable of messing up big time? Of course we are. But we're not evil or loathsome. And God's grace isn't charity, it's genuine love. Looking at Jesus helps us understand both God and humanity. So let's use Jesus as a lens as we briefly take each of those kind of views in turn and we look at more of our questions. First of all then, this one. Love? What about all that death? and vengeance, and suffering. Wow. This, I need to be clear, isn't a message about those things. But it could easily become one. We could talk about the time at which the Old Testament was written, the context, who it was written by. We could talk about the gift of free will. And how that prevents God's hand from dictating the outcome of every situation. We could simply talk about the mysteries of God. But because we're looking through a Jesus lens, I want to focus in on some New Testament words and events that help us understand some of that Old Testament view. 
In the first chapter of his account of Jesus' life, the disciple and apostle John wrote this. No one has ever seen God. But the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Church family, if we want to honestly consider what God is like, we've got to look across the whole Bible to see those things in the New Testament that support what was said in the Old Testament, to see the themes that run right the way through. I mean, when you look at the life of Jesus, this one who has made the Father known, what do you see? Death? No. In fact, quite the opposite. Do you see vengeance? No. In fact, quite the opposite. This is the man who with nails in his hands and his feet, with a crown of thorns on his head, with barely a breath of life left in him, said, Father, forgive them. And suffering? He sought to release people from it. At the very least, he stood alongside people in the most difficult moments of their lives, offering them peace beyond understanding. He grieved alongside those who grieved. He wept alongside those who wept. This is a God who loves you. But my experience of people loving me tells me they'll only let me down. That's fair. Human love doesn't always live up to expectations, does it? And sometimes our perception of God is made even harder because the kind of imagery used in the Bible, even in our songs, can be problematic. For example, if we compare God to a good father, that evokes different pictures for everyone, some of which might be helpful and some of which might not. But as we've discovered, if there's anyone to compare God's love to, ultimately, it has to be Jesus, because he showed what is possible. Ah, but he wasn't even a father, you might be saying. True, but we saw on not more than one occasion how he felt about children. We saw the love that he had for his own family. And all of that, well, that relates back to the Old Testament. The fact that the Israelites, the people Isaiah was speaking to, are sometimes called the children of God. The point is that God loved his chosen people the way that good parents love their children. God gave up other nations for them. Those words we read today said that Egypt and Cush and Seba were given up because he wasn't prepared to let his chosen people go, his cherished people go. He wanted the best for them, despite them consistently messing up. And ultimately, he was prepared to sacrifice anything in fact, everything, just to show them how much he loved them. Of course, any comparison to humanity outside of Jesus, whether male or female, mother or father, old or young, is going to be problematic because humanity without God is flawed. And a love that is flawed lets people down, which is why... Those comparisons aren't always helpful. And especially when we allow them to dominate our view of who God is. Now I accept that might not answer a further question you've got. Which is more about you. How could God possibly love me? 
Sadly, so many of us feel like this, not necessarily all the time, but it's fair to say we've probably all had our moments. In John 14, we hear Jesus say these words, If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Jesus is saying in these words, God looks like me. Everything Jesus did was to show what God was like. But what we often forget is that Jesus also says, albeit indirectly, I look like you. Let me explain. If we want to honestly consider what humanity is, we've got to pay less attention to our own failures and our mess-ups or all those of others we see in the world around us and look to another theme that runs right the way through the Bible. Where our expectation of humanity often looks like losing our rag or getting frustrated with others, often over the smallest things, Jesus offers a humanity where a naked, bleeding man on a cross still has the heart and the presence of mind to care for his mother. The hope that Jesus offers is that even in the midst of the worst situations that life seems to throw at us, we can hold on to the truth of who we are. We don't need to lose ourselves. We may think that we're the worst of the worst. You may be feeling that as you listen to this now. We may be thinking that we so often fall short of the image that God's put within us. But through the cross, Jesus cleanses and polishes that image and gives it back to us. Jesus shows who we are and shows how through his love we get to be whole. How we get to be a new creation made complete in his love. Church family, the journey of following Jesus is not a journey of escaping our humanity, but the journey to discover the truth of it. And it's a journey that starts with you experiencing for yourself the truth that when God looks at you, he is full to the brim of love for you. He would give everything, did give everything, to give you the chance to be restored to the fullness of the image that he gave you in the first place. In a moment, we're going to worship. Intentionally, we're going to dwell in God's love for us and give ourselves an opportunity just to say thank you to him for it. But first, let me read to you again the words of Isaiah 43. And then I'm going to read some words from 1 John chapter 4, written in the Passion Translation. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Sabre in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honoured and I love you, I give men in return for you, people in exchange for your life. We have seen with our own eyes and can testify to the truth that Father God has sent his Son to be the Saviour of the world. Those who give thanks that Jesus is the Son of God live in God and God lives in them. 
we have come into an intimate experience with God's love. And we trust in the love that he has for us. Church family, God looks at you today and just as he did through the words of Isaiah, God says to you, I love you. Today and in the days ahead, may we know the truth of those words. May we experience God's love in our lives. Father God, we thank you for your love as you pour out your love on us. Help us to open our hearts to you. Help us to come to you like children, ready to soak that love up. May we know today, Lord, that we are cherished by you and may that change the way we live. May we live like we're loved. Father God, restore us through the power of the cross, through the power of Jesus, through the power of the resurrection, through the power of your love, to be the people that you first created us to be. Thank you for your love, Father God. Amen. Love unlike the world has known. The love that left no stone unturned. The love that fought.
And the things are 
I had the opportunity this week to talk to Sarah Millington. And the Millingtons are one of those families who have experienced COVID and it's in their house at the moment. Um, so it's a really interesting time to talk to them in what's been a tough week. Um, and I've had the chance to just talk to Sarah about what it means to her to follow and some of the questions around God's love that we heard Steve speak about as well. So here's a really interesting chat that I had this week with Sarah. So church family, I have Sarah Millington who is in the middle of a COVID house right now. How are you doing Sarah? How's the family? Oh yeah, we are. Um, so, so far four of us, out of five of us um, have um, had COVID. The children are just starting to test clear um, uh, and can potentially get out of jail tomorrow, but the grown-ups still look like they're very much in jail for the foreseeable future. So, <laughs> um, we, we, we didn't do too bad. We had three or four days of not feeling good, um, but then like we, we feel well again now. We're just waiting for those two negative tests in a row. So here's hoping. Okay, well, this, this is going to go out on Sunday, which I believe you just said is your birthday. Yes, it is. And that is my first day where I'm allowed out of jail, regardless of test results. So um, that's that's nice. <laughs> Free for my birthday. Oh, that, that, I mean, that's a little bit of positive timing, even if it hasn't been the, the most pleasant of run ups. Yeah, we're back to the homeschooling hell. It was sort of gives me memories of the first lockdown and, and just shivers down my spine. So um, we're, we're back in that mode at the moment. <laughs> it, it is a very strange thing. Having been through that in our family, that one week was just a reminder of that whole weird time. Of I look back at it. How did we do that for like weeks and months on end? Like, I know, I know. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, obviously, we've been looking so far this year at the concept of following. And at the moment, we're looking through uh, The Chosen and how uh, that sort of visual um, series helps us to understand and look at following in a different way. But I thought I'd start off with a couple of the questions we've had from previous weeks, which are a little bit lighter um, and help us maybe to, to know a little bit more about you for those who've not had an opportunity to, uh, to chat to in person. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is what scares you? Well, I was, it's a hard question because I couldn't think of a quick answer. Like, I'm not scared of a lot of what you think might be the usual things, like snakes and spiders, um, not too bad with. Um, I did, we lived in Africa for um, a few years. And so, um, you know, not too bad with that. But that's, so I was thinking, what's the, what's the time in my life when I've been the most scared? And that was definitely when I did a skydive for the Winter Night Shelter a couple of years ago um, with some colleagues. And um, that was, yeah, hands down, the scariest thing I've done but then I was thinking how actually fear is quite sort of relative so I've got a friend Natalie who is like an adrenaline junkie she's very adventurous and when she had the opportunity to do a skydive she did um, a solo skydive so for mine it was a tandem skydive and you're strapped to a experienced instructor instructor and um they sort of monitor when they should pull the ripcord and then you, you you you're just kind of like cargo and you're kind of in their hands um and I could cope with that even though it was very scary but the thought of doing the jump out the plane being in charge of when to deploy my own chute and being solely in control is beyond terrifying to me so um in a in a weird way it's kind of like a neat little analogy for I suppose my my walk with God and my faith because it's very reassuring that whatever I jump into in life I'm actually not solely relying on my own strength and my own con control of the situation you know I'm I'm very much um in God's hands the thought of doing something entirely you know in my own strength or under my own control that's 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 the scary bit I think so and, and you're braver than me I mean I'm a little bit nervous in a plane but the idea of exiting a plane uh, while it's not on land um strikes me as a daft thing it, it uh, was the scariest thing I've ever seen <laughs> you know yeah oh shivers Ugh. Second one, and this is from sort of last week when we were looking at rest and Shabbat. What do you find restful? And it's probably not a week worth of um, homeschooling, to be honest. So where, where do you find rest? Um, I think for me, rest, sort of be, rest being something much more substantial than just getting an early night if you're a bit tired. You know, it's that proper stopping and soaking up and re recharging and regenerating. Um I try and do I do try as a as a Christian to sort of have my Sabbath once a week but obviously as a 
um, a family with, especially when the children were younger, it was just impossible and very, very difficult to do that in a meaningful way because every day is is, is so busy. Um, but I've, I've been learning over the years how to get better at doing that. And I'm better now than I used to be. So um, there's a brilliant book called um, Present Over Perfect by Shauna Nequist. And she talks in there about the concept of how mums in particular do a lot of fake resting. So it's like on a Saturday morning, you might all be sort of in your pyjamas and then the family will be like, playing video games or having a relaxed breakfast or just generally chilling, watching TV. And as the mum, you feel like you're resting because you're still in your pyjamas, but you're actually pottering around and tidying up and putting the laundry on and making sure things are sorted for lunch or whatever. And you're not actually stopping. So I'm getting better at recognising don't fake rest properly. Take some rest. Um, but it's not easy sort of with busy lives. And if you, I used to get quite tied up with sort of thinking I mustn't be doing anything on a Sunday and Sundays have to be complete rest, but that doesn't always feel practical until I really focused on the fact that in the Jewish tradition, when they talk about Sabbath, the day begins at sundown and then ends at sundown. And so I started to try and get into a rest mindset from a Saturday evening to Sunday evening sundown. And that really helped me because I had a really relaxed Sunday, but then I still had Sunday evening to think about, right, getting the kids pee kit ready for the next day, shoving on an emergency laundry load if needed. You know, if I had a work meeting Monday morning, I had, you know, could send off some emails or prepare for that without feeling like, oh, I failed, like Sunday isn't mm -hmm. this complete day of rest. So that little shift of mindset definitely helped me. And then every now and then, just because of how I'm wired, I, I definitely need, um, a more away type of rest. So in the gospels, we know that Jesus every now and then retreated from the crowds and went to the mountainside to pray. And I definitely have my times where I need to sort of go to the mountains, particularly because I'm, I recognize I'm an introvert personality and I, I get my energy from time alone and, you know, I restore myself um, from time spent alone. So um, I have been known to take myself off to an Airbnb without the family for the weekend, just me, God and the dog, um, take my Bible and just really um, soak up being out of my house where all the busy jobs need to be done, being away, getting some perspective. Um, and so every now and then, and my husband's very good about, knowing that I need that and being able to hold the fort at home. And if, if I'm going through a particularly stressful time or, or he can just sense that I need it, he's like, do you need to go away again? I'm like, yes. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. That's really nice. This week we're moving on to looking at God's unconditional love. Um, so, um, and I know you won't have heard what Steve's got to say today about that, but we wondered really what comes to mind when you mull over unconditional godly love kind of rather than human love which just doesn't match up really yeah I think the key thing about it's that word unconditional isn't it? it it kind of within that there's there's knowledge that there's no strings attached you know you don't it's not something you have to earn and I think in life we're used to having to earn sort of brownie points or credit or whatever we do in life and so having something unconditional for free is quite unusual most relationships I think we have as people are based on some kind of social contract where there's some kind of benefit on both sides um and I think probably that the relationship that comes closest to one of unconditional love is probably that parent-child relationship you know the love a parent has for their child that's probably the closest we come to the kind of love that God has for us, but even though it's just a glimpse compared to the, you know, depth and strength and the purity of, of God's love for us. But I think um, that's probably the one, but I, I think sometimes on your Christian sort of journey, if you come to faith and you experience God's touching your heart in some way and you get a glimpse of that love and it feels amazing and you feel loved um, and it's a really great thing. And then sometimes over the years that can get faded or forgotten. I think we all need reminding, um, you know, regularly of God's unconditional love and how it is unconditional and we don't have to strive because we can all slip, I think, into that sort of rut of trying to strive a little bit, even if it's subconsciously. I, lo I love being around new Christians, actually, because they yeah, that's that's really new to them quite yeah. quite often. And when you sit there and, 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 and you see that wow moment that people who are experiencing it really new and fresh sort of bring... You just sit there and go, oh, do you know what I have? I have. I've let that slip. I've forgotten that. I've taken that for granted. Yeah, I've people call it the first love, don't they? That yeah. first love when you first encounter um, God in, in your life. And uh, yeah, it, it's um, 
it's a wonderful thing and it's it's important not to get not not to let that get suppressed by you know everyday ongoing long-term pressures and cares you know and and the way that society sees love you know the, the rest of the world sees love in a very different way and some of the conditional aspects of love that you talked about I think society just takes that as love they see it they see it more as symbiotic as like will you give yeah. and take and this and that whereas actually we're talking about a god whose love is very very different yeah there's not many people or situations in the wider world where love is just given completely freely without any expectation of anything in return and everyone gets very skeptical about anything that looks like it's it's free and unconditional they're like oh hang on where's the <laughs> yeah it's that concept isn't it of like if you do somebody a favor because you want to help them out they then feel like oh that, I, 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 I'm, I'm gonna do that back yeah 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 absolutely I'm gonna this, do you owe me back <laughs> yeah like inviting somebody and, that, you know, and as a mother and as a mother obviously you know uh, as a parent you know we've got to show that to our children um how do we how do we do that how do, what do we want our children to understand about god's love and how do we sort of try and show that off oh, well love is like amazingly complex and there's so many layers within it but it's also incredibly simple and i think when children are small it's a it's not a difficult thing to just keep reinforcing to them how much they're loved and if you if they're in a a loving home and especially if you're kind of bringing them up um in a church environment as well they'll they'll hear about god's love and they will you know they get that in sunday school and, and it's not too hard i think for them to um, hear about it a lot i think the test with children comes as they get older and then they get more independent and they might you know they fly the nest and, and they experience you know the big tough wide world out there and i think that can be a time where that gets tested and that's where you hope that that not just the knowledge of god's love but an experience of god's love in their heart is gonna um hold them fast and and sort of see them through and i was thinking about this and i think for my children there's there's two elements of what i'd love them to understand about god's love and there's two sort of verses that sort of um explain those really well so the one is just how sort of extensive god's love is and how much it's better than human love and so there's a i'll just read it out if i may there's um verse in ephesians 3 when paul says um and i pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of christ and it's just so much more, you know, than our human love. And then the other side of it is that you, it's um, it's everywhere. You can't escape God's love. He's loving you from every angle, wherever you are. And, you know, if you grow up and leave home and you end up on the other side of the world, God's love will still be with you there. And it's that um, those well-known verses from Psalm 139 um, where it says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. And so, yeah, I suppose thinking from where my children are now, who are seven, nine and 11, um, not, not tiny anymore, but they're still very much young. Um, I know as they sort of um, move into the future of their lives, their, their sort of experience and knowledge of God's love will be tested by the world. And I hope that they'll be able to know the extent of God's love, how big and how wide and how deep it is. And also the fact that they can't, you can run, but you can't hide. You know, God is with you and wherever you are and whatever you're doing. And that I think for a lot of parents gives comfort as well, because you can worry about your children when they're off doing things and wonder how they're doing but there's a lot of comfort in those words in the psalm that you know god is with, with them every day wherever they are and you know god is love so and for the, the kind of the bad news for both you and me there is our children are both uh, are all young enough uh, that the biggest mopping up uh, might be coming uh, as they start to you know do relationships and you know uh you navigate that whole thing out <laughs> at school and i think we've we've probably managed mainly to avoid that but you know you Come know in. <laughs> daniel's in year seven adam's in year eight it's coming that's right <laughs> <laughs> one last question thank you so much for your time but one last question that i didn't warn you about i mean obviously you're, you're out of um out of restrictions the two of you on sunday and monday is valentine's day have you got any plans? 
<laughs> trying to get through COVID and just trying to, get, <laughs> trying to get, well, being able to get, even go out the house and go for a nice walk would be a lovely Valentine's treat. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit different uh, this year for you, isn't it? Because it's it be, yeah. be like your second day out, so it might just be a walk. Yeah, <laughs> and that's cheap, fine. That's a cheap way of doing Valentine's Day, but quite and a lot. I'm low way. maintenance, Peter. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Sarah. I'm sure there are some absolute nuggets of knowledge in there for for, for people watching. Um, some some really good solid answers. Thank you so much for your time. Brilliant, thank you. Church family, I really hope you've had the opportunity to enjoy some worship, um, enjoy the word that Steve brought to us, uh, and some of what Sarah said in that interview as well. I think I hope you've really enjoyed hearing some other voices, some congregational. Uh, voices, some of the guys um, that we don't always normally hear from, and as to how they see following Jesus and how that looks in different settings, different experiences. And we're going to continue those over the coming weeks as well. I hope you've had a really good opportunity to connect with God and with those dates that we talked about at the beginning, the exciting opportunities that, the, that this year brings. It's a really exciting time to be church right now. So as we finish today, we're going to pray. We're going to pray that something from today's service just sticks with you. That if God has something for you to take away this week, that he'll bring it back. Time and again, gently nudging and reminding us of some of the challenges that he brought to us today. So, let's pray now. Lord God, I pray that you give just a lasting, sticking energy to, to what you have for us as a church and individually from today's service. That as we looked at your love, that what we need to take from that and what we need to apply and what we need to remember, Lord God, just stays close to our heart this week. Remind us of what we need reminding of. Thank you for the opportunity to look at what it really truly means to follow you. And we pray that this week, Lord God, that you will give us the opportunity to put that into action. Bless us, Lord God, whether we do church online at the moment, whether we're in the building, whether we're going to life groups, we ask, Lord God, that you help keep us close and tight together as a church as we seek you, as we try and work out what following you in this strange and unusual time looks like. We lift these prayers to you. And we say, Lord God, bless your people here at Newport Pagan Baptist Church. We ask in your almighty, powerful name. Amen. Church family, I hope you've been blessed by the service today. And I hope to see or speak to you soon. Take care and God bless. Jesus, take